Hopefully, I'm just going to check to see how we how we're doing. I'm making sure we're live. We are. So I'm going to introduce you to tonight's special guest, who is Gareth James of Affidian Audio. How are you doing, Gareth? Fine, thanks, Terry. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Are you looking forward to the football match this evening? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Definitely looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> it should be good. It should be fun. I mean, it's always stressful as an England, uh, well, an English person or an England fan. It's always stressful watching big games like this. And I remember loads of them as a youngster where we, we come unstuck. But is this year going to be the year? Is this time going to be our time? It could well be, couldn't it? Could be. Could be. <laughs> I, I watched the match yesterday. I thought um, interesting stuff. Um, I think we could beat either of those teams, really. But um, you never know, do you? <laughs> So. You never know. That, that, to be honest, that is exactly how I felt watching it as well. But I tell you what, let's put us both on the uh, both on the screen. There we are, and hopefully, you know, people are joining us. And again, remember, get involved in the chat section, comment section, ask you questions. I've got some questions for Gareth that I want to go through and run through with him, because to be honest, Gareth, you've been going or Affiliate Audio has been going about ten years, isn't it, as a business? I'm sure it's 2011 that you started. Yes, in fact. Uh, in four days, it will have been exactly ten years oh, wow. since I incorporated the company. So, so, so um, to me, yeah. ten ten years is a very long period of time to do anything. But yeah, my my first in, in suppose... hi-fi terms though, in <laughs> hi-fi terms, they're quite short, isn't it? Yeah, it's obviously yeah in business, obviously baby. But you know, to me, it's like a, a long period of time to do something. And we, we spoke briefly up before we went live that you know, the hi-fi industry is what it is. It's a very very competitive place. Now, I'm sure it was a competitive place 10 years ago. So, you know, the big question for me is why start a, a speaker company at all? And what would you say makes Affidian Audio unique? Um, interesting question. Um, why start a speaker company? I guess, really, for me, um, it's what I knew. Um, I got into hi fi originally by messing around um, with. Um, hi-fi speakers from a very early age and just trying to fix old speakers that had damage and um, I guess it was speakers specifically that kind of took my interest um, every facet of uh, hi-fi system is important but I think um, if you're going to specialize in one thing you just got to go with what, what's grabbed your attention the first time whether it's turntables, speakers, amps and uh, speakers is what uh, did it for me and, uh, I've been dabbling with them since I was maybe 16, 17, building my first sets and uh, just went from there. So what, what was your so, first pair of speakers, actually, thinking about it? They were full. <laughs> <laughs> people always like to know um, what people buy and stuff, don't they? So. <laughs> f well, first pairs were probably inherited uh, Sansui uh, SP3500s, so quite unique. They were um, the four or five way. They were quite bizarre. Uh, with two super tweeters, uh, two mid, as they called them, squawkers at the time, uh, a mid horn in the middle, and then a 14 inch bass driver. Wow. So, um, and it was the bass driver surround that had failed. So I glued it all back together and uh, they sounded all right. They, actually, I was about to say they don't, they don't make speakers like that anymore, but we can talk a bit about that maybe in a second. <laughs> but I'm sure there's reasons yeah. why. But obviously, my mm. question was probably a tough one, really. What makes a feeling audio unique? But I suppose, what, what is your driving factor as, as a speaker manufacturer? What are you looking to achieve with the speakers? Um, well, uh, as you say, just try to do something a little bit different to what everyone else is doing. Um, if you just try to copy everyone else, uh, you're not going to generate much interest. You've got to do something that's just you. And I guess what makes my company unique is me, my, my approach to things. Um, it, it's not necessarily groundbreaking, but it's, I, I just do things differently. There are, I, I've always thought with speakers, especially there's, you know, a, a million different ways to skin the cat, so to speak. And, um, there's, so, I mean, if you look at the breadth of designs that you can go out and buy at whatever price level these days, um, I just think there's always room to do something a little bit different um, and you know it, it's got to sound good obviously <laughs> but um, yeah well I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the different ranges you've got on the speakers in a second yes um, I mean I kind of kind of asked this question a little bit already but my second question was I've spoke to a few different speaker designers and, and they normally say that things are 
uh, yeah, they have to pick priorities. They go with a certain design, and there's some compromises that have to come along as part of the process. And I assume those yeah. compromises could come from price. They could come from size. Um, you know, from any number of different factors. But as a speaker designer, what aspects of a speaker's design do you think is most important? Um, yeah, I, I, again, I think that's it's a good question. I think um, tricky one to answer in kind of um, a definitive. Uh, you know, what what do I think is the most important aspect? Because I think it is all compromise and um, whatever you're designing. As you mentioned, if it's everything is designed to to a certain price point, even the most high end of speakers, there's a, you know there's uh, considerations as to the uh, how much every single part in it costs. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, and again, what is the purpose? Is it a, is it a small speaker like, like some of my smaller designs, like the Minimo? It's designed for a very specific uh, scenario in a lot of ways. Um, is it a large floor stander? All of these things has to be considered but um i i just think it's a balance of things and you can't kind of prioritize one thing over the other um otherwise you'll come a cropper ultimately uh, and end up with something that's but you know it's biased one way and not so good in other ways well, maybe a different way to ask the question then would be where do you start with a design do you start with maybe how it looks or do you start with well i want i want a, i want it to be a small speaker i want it to be a large speaker i want it to be a three-way a two-way you know what what yeah, how, how do you? Where do you start? You know, you know, how do you work through the process? Yeah. Um, I do a lot of uh, computer simulation to do kind of um, initial ideas. Whether it's um, a new um, base drivers on the market, I think, oh, that looks interesting. Let's simulate that. What, what could I do with that? Um, I, I do literally. I mean, over the years, I've done literally thousands and thousands of iterations of simulation because it's just. A good way of working out what's going to be maybe usable, um, but obviously beyond that, then you're into prototyping an actual design and measurement and, uh, and so forth. But um, yeah, it's just brainstorming, I guess, coming up with ideas for a purpose for the speaker. Um, what, like you say, what size is it going to be? What, what role is it going to fill? Um, in the case of the M series, um, we've got three speakers that um, fill you know, a multitude of roles in a lot of ways. They can each be used as a stereo system. Uh, you can pair them together as uh, into a surround system. Um, you, you know, you could have uh, mambos at the front, your floor standing speakers for your mains. You could have minimos at the back, so uh, the sides, uh, mojos, whichever way. And uh, because they all use common drivers they, and they use a, a, a kind of common um, family sound as a result, um, you can mix and match, and that they all go together quite well. So that, so that that was the intention then. So someone might might use them as, for, yeah, in different in different scenarios. Really, okay, that makes sense. It, exactly. I mean, a pair of Minimo could be a great desktop system, or it could be in a smaller lounge. It could be the main system that um, that you use, um, right up to Mambo's, Minimo's, Mojo at the front, yeah. uh, and mix and match. Because yeah, it's quite interesting, really, because we said before about you know, they don't make these speakers anymore. And it, it seems like the hi-fi yeah. industry is – a lot of companies are following suit because – I think they follow suit because that is the expectations that people expect. A stand mount speaker, they expect you know, a floor stand – a floor standing speaker maybe a, you know, a bigger version yeah. of, of the stand mount and stuff like that. So I can imagine it's, diff it's yeah. difficult to be very innovative because it's not what necessarily what people are looking mm. for because they're out of that trend or they're not looking for that type of trend of product. Yeah, I, I think – the further up you go price wise you can get a bit more creative um with you know the the design in general um but um I, I, none of the speakers i've done at the moment are or, or yet are at that kind of extreme price level where you can kind of go um you know any any which way um but um i yeah, I'd say that there's definitely, if in in case of the M series especially, you know they're designed to a certain price point. Uh, I wanted them to be British made, British manufactured, which kind of uh, limits the price a little bit because obviously the cabinets are quite expensive to man manufacture here. But it's I think it's something that's important for me um, to do as much as I can here. I mean, um, but yeah, to to be designed to a certain price point, I think there's also 
limitations uh limitations but um there's a certain scope that each speaker needs to fit into what what its role will be what it's going to be competing against and you know obviously i look at the market and see what other speakers are out there at different price points and think okay so that's what i'm up against and um yeah I mean, to be, to be fair, that was probably the most interesting thing for me to, about doing the recent speaker group test is look, you're looking at mm. some of the more esoteric companies or, or I don't want to say smaller mm. companies because that sounds demeaning, but you've got some of the large, obviously what seems like the larger companies or more well-established brand names looked at their speakers mm. and then I compared them to some of the well, maybe English company speakers like yourself and, and maybe Neat Acoustics and a couple of others. And th the standard was high yeah. across every single speaker. It, it was... The, the first couple were similar-ish, if that makes sense. It was like they were trying to achieve the same goal in a similar yeah. way. Different each, but similar. And then the second half of the group test was a big variety, and that was nice to see because I was running out of things to say, actually, about the first five because they were also <laughs> similar. It's like, give me something different, give yeah. me something different. So, And the, mo the Mojo yeah. 2 really stood out to me, actually, because... You know, it's one of those, you look at it and you think it's very small, you can hold it in your hands, it's not massively heavy. Mm. And sometimes as an audio file, you think, well, a big heavy box, a big heavy box, you know, it, it makes you feel a certain way about something. But when you actually sit sit down and listen to something with, with a certain expectation based on that, and it actually surprises you in ways, you think, oh, wow, this is actually really quite interesting. And there was lots of things about the Mojo 2 that stood out to me in terms of how open they sounded. It was like, you know, they did a very, very good disappearing act. And something that I didn't say in the review, and I, I actually put it in and I took it out because I, I actually wasn't sure. It's like these are sounding as open and, and as clear as the Kefal S50 Meta, which is a really big praise because that's a hugely, man, massively well engineered speaker. And if, if you're on that kind of level of that kind of a, achievement, that's bloody good. But I, I could, I could, I wasn't sure if I could say it or not because I wasn't 100% on, on it. It's like, but it's close. You know, it's bloody close. So <laughs> that was a big achievement. And obviously, that's why you got an essential edition award, which. Probably was the highlight of your year, of course. Um, <laughs> but let's let's quickly talk about. Oh, go on. Sorry, yeah, feel feel free. Um, uh, no, just um, to to be honest, I, I was just going to say, as far as the group test went, um, obviously uh, there was a huge range of companies involved, right mm. from like like you say, Kef with the LS50 being a huge company, right down mm. to me probably at the bo the bottom is in terms of company size. But um, it's quite good to be considered. Uh, you know, with with a product that's in the same kind of uh, league, so that's good enough for me, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, well, it's a difficult one because, you know, to, to try and do a group test like that because there are bigger, mm. physically bigger speakers, and obviously a couple of them are physically smaller, like the Mojo Two and a couple of others. So, you know, your expectation has to shift a little bit in terms of what what you're going to get out of that because it's not fair to compare. Um, something like the Mojo 2 or, or the Sonus Faber Lumina 1 against something like the Bukart S300, which is a, a huge speaker by, by comparison. So you can't have the same expectations for both. So that's why I tried to break it up a little bit. But obviously, price point-wise, they're all similar. So someone can choose one or the other within that same budget range. But I don't think they will. And that is what I was trying to get across, Gareth, in the sense. It's like, you know, what's important to you? Because... Um, yeah, a different person's going to buy one of these speakers for different reasons. Um, Abs absolutely agree. I, I think, um, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think um, ultimately, um, I, I really quite enjoyed your conclusion, and that <laughs> not one speaker is going to be perfect for everyone. And yeah, ab like you say, um, that there are maybe certain speakers that you liked particularly, but also you, people need to listen for themselves mm -hmm. and work out what is best for them. Uh, and like, like you say, the different size differences, and you know different things people are looking for. Um, I put an ad on um, recently um, for, and somebody commented about um, floor standards versus uh, stand mounts. And um, I just, it just made me think that, I mean, again, that's just personal preference. Somebody yeah. will always go for the floor standard because they feel it takes up similar amount of space. You don't have to buy a pair of stands, etc. But then some people much prefer the sound from stand mounts and you're always going to have that divide and not one speaker is going to um, be the perfect one for everyone. <laughs> what, what's really interesting, uh, up until recently, or this year, I would have said 100%, 100 I'm a, I'm a floor standing audiophile because I like bass, because I really appreciate it. I, I say a lot yeah. of bass, but it is a lot of bass. I, I don't think it's a lot, but, but compared to what a lot of other people have in their systems, it will be a lot. Mm. But there's reasons why I, I, I chase that, equal loudness and, and other things. Um, yeah. 
But obviously this year I've looked at a lot of stand mount speakers that are delivering a lot of bass. And it's like, wow, how is that happening? And I'm starting to see a bit of a trend in terms of lowering the crossover point between the tweeter and the and the driver. So the driver's doing less of the mid-range. So therefore I assume they're freeing up more of the speaker to do more of the bass. I, I, I kind of see that little, little bit of a trend because it, it seemed to me it used to be everyone was crossing over at 2.8 kilohertz. That, I don't know why, I'd, in my head that is the two-way design you have a tweeter and a mid bass driver it crosses over about 2.8 and that that is how it works but i've seen a lot of well just recently loads of different ones that do it very different to that even crossing over you know down at 1.4 or 1.6 kilohertz which it's not mm. it's not a massive difference actually but it feels like a massive difference when you it sounds different actually when you listen to them as well oh uh, absolutely i mean in fact really it's it's quite a big difference to cross over at say one and a half versus three k i mean that's an entire octave of of oh, sound wow. and and um that's when you kind of think more in terms of uh, how many octaves uh, uh that each drive is kind of taking care of in terms of bass uh treble or if you had a three way speaker emitted um yeah it's quite interesting as you say with the tweeters especially i think there's been quite a lot of advances um maybe not so much um kind of year on year but over the last kind of decade or two in terms of tweeters um especially i mean the the, the, the one that we use in the m series you know it's a it's quite compact because it uses a, a a small neodymium magnet as opposed to a quite a, a larger ferrite magnet but um the power handling is quite large it's um you know 200 watts peak power so it's more than enough uh, that uh, uh, you know that any of the uh, m series would take um but yeah that they're, they're, they're a lot more capable is, is what i'm trying to mm. say um and i think you can get away with a you know lower crossover point in some cases um it's a balance though depending on what mm. what you're using um what mid you're using and what, what base drive you're using so yeah, I thought it might be a, a trick to get a smoother frequency response, to be honest, because I figured the tweeter is just behaving better in that region because you're asking a lot of a, a bigger, heavier driver to to work fast, aren't mm -hmm. you, as well as as well as well work slow. That that was always, to me, the uh, yes. the, the quantity of the two-way speaker. You're asking a lot from you know, just just two drivers, really. You are asking yeah. a lot, but then I suppose you are, you've got the advantage of not trying to make four or five or whatever to kind of be in phase with each other and all those other problems that comes come mm -hmm. with that. I, I, I don't want to pass over my questions because I'll get myself out of sync, Gareth, but I wanted to ask okay. you about, because obviously I've only looked at one of your speakers, and I, I think I listened to the P-Series sure. at the Bristol show whenever there was Hi-Fi shows a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> let me get my questions back up, but I just want to pop this up on the screen. So you've got the M-Series, and then you've also got the P-Series. So mm -hmm. what is the difference? Uh, who are they aimed at? And kind of, is, is there any design differences or, you know, I suppose, what are the differences between them? Well, um, the P-Series has been going in a couple of different forms since 2017, I think it was, the first iteration. Uh, that's the Evolution Series that we're looking at now. Yeah. And uh, basically, um, the, the P-Series um, is essentially offering a, a larger, uh, larger format, um, more high-end components in the crossover um, and just you know a larger scale than what the M series are capable of producing um, so uh, especially in in terms of say the P2 and P3 uh, they're actually the same size the floor standards uh, but they use different um, components inside obviously um, the base drivers in the P3 uh, use the same size magnet as the P2 uh, but a slightly sm smaller cone, so it's um, yeah, it's, uh, they were designed to be used basically the same cabinet, but with two different driver sets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but obviously two completely different concepts, one being two point five way and one three way. Mm. So, so I we've we've cause again cause, because I've only listened to the Mojo too. We, we've mm -hmm. it, I suppose it's a better question: Is there an Ophidian Audio house sound? If I listen to one of the P series speakers, would I? notice a difference? Are, are you trying to tailor them for a different customer's ear? Obviously a different budget, but is, is it for a different customer or are you trying to create a house sound? I think ultimately you definitely find a house sound anyway, especially, I mean, I'm the one that does all of the tuning and, you know, all, all of the technical work. So ultimately, you know, what I'm listening to 
uh, and what I'm what I'm aiming towards with the design uh, will end up towards some kind of a house sound, although it may develop over the years as it has done. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think there is definitely a, an aim towards a certain sound, but um, it evolves year on year. I think is the best way of describing it. Would, would you say is that based on you becoming a better designer, learning learning as you go, to, to, taking on feedback? I assume as well. Absolutely. Um, ultimately, I think the idea that you can just kind of, um, you know, come up with a design and go, okay, that's finished, and that's that's the best design that's finished and uh, you know you're, you're always learning something new so yeah. um whether it's me or whether it's uh you know a much bigger more established company they're always trying to do something better than they did the last time so uh, to be honest i actually quite like that i know in a way it, it can feel oh i've just i've just bought these new speakers and now they've brought out a new pair it's, it's always a bit of a, a, a yeah. kick in but that's the same with everything in this industry but i, I like in every industry as well it's the same with phones and headphones and everything isn't it but i, I like to yeah. see the development of the industry so it's interesting to see like, or hear that tweeters have improved and these designs have improved because there's a lot of stigma that you know the industry hasn't gone anywhere in the last 10 or 20 years and everything's still the same yeah. and again listening to these stand mount bookshelf speakers i went into this group test expecting a certain type of performance from these speakers and all of them pretty much exceeded my expectations in terms of delivering bass output it's mostly bass output but they really exceeded my expectations like how is this bass coming out of these very small compact speakers and so, some yeah. of that is where i put them in the room i use the room and i load the room that i mean i do that of all speakers on purpose that's just how i like to tune the sound in there but either way it's not all speakers do it he's still so i've been hugely impressed by um to me, that's a, that's a development. It's like a you know a stand mount speaker achieving more th than I think they would have done years ago. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I, I think also the competition. Um, I mean, the competition's always been quite high in hi-fi, but I think um, at that price point that you were looking at, that is especially high right now. And um, as you correctly pointed out in your summary, there is a lot of uh, good speakers. Um, um, you know, it's pretty difficult to go wrong when you're looking at that kind of price range. There are a lot of good speakers out there, so um, I think that's, I think that's, in some ways, it's little incremental changes in lots of different areas rather than huge step changes. So I think it'd be quite easy to look at the industry and go, okay, we're still using, you know, the Kellogg's and Rice principle um, with moving mag, you know, moving coil and magnets and you know, what's the difference, but actually manufacturing, little changes in manufacturing over the years has improved year on year. So, yeah, and as a result, the manufacturers of the speakers are able to just slowly increase the quality of what their product yeah. is. So. Well, there's also a lot of stationary things in the hi-fi industry. You've got music deliveries, obviously it's starting to step up more recently, but it's been CD quality for mm. decades, hasn't it really? So, and, and I would assume yep. because of that, you know the production music recording and, and that professional side of the industry has probably worked a certain way for a really long period of time and you know they've probably tailored that so you can always blame the source i never blame the source i always blame myself the audio file it's the audio file who makes it work you know it has to make the sound work but the, the other thing is it's, it's the listening room you know most hi-fi or audio files are listening yes. in, just in lounges or you know rooms that are not designed for audio in fact they're designed well, they're, they're terrible for audio in most rooms. I'm, I'm big in acoustics and I understand all that. And it's like, we're, yep. all, we're all working in really difficult conditions. Everybody's trying to make it work in these conditions. And that, that hasn't changed ever. And that probably never will change. So mm. what I was going to say is I can imagine that's, that's one of the most difficult things as a speaker designer is what room is this going in? You know, what, you know, what, what conditions are they going in? Especially with things like treble. Do you want a livelier mm. treble for a more damped room? Or do you want a more rolled off treble for a, you know, a modern sparse you know, uh, exposed wood floor, li very lively room. It's like, how do you make that decision? Very, very difficult to do. I think ultimately, um, if you're designing a speaker that is, uh, especially if you're designing a passive loudspeaker that is, you know, uh, and you're, you're not planning on putting tone controls or any kind of adjustment, then you've got to kind of go for a balance that's somewhere in the middle. Um, and uh, w when I'm designing stuff, I try to, listen to my stuff in as many different rooms as possible oh, wow. uh, obviously i do a lot of measurement and myself and and try and tune to what i what, what i'm aiming at anyway but um yeah there's no beating just listening to you know as many different setups as many different uh, much different equipment as possible um 
Yeah, what one of the uh, frustrations actually, I would say, in, in terms of the dealers is actually finding dealers with decent listening rooms because mm -hmm. not all of them uh, have particularly good listening rooms. And um, yeah, um, you, you think if you, if you want somebody to listen to your speakers in their best light, then they've got to be listened to in a decent room. I mean, you've got, I mean, obviously I've, I've met quite a lot of dealers now and spoke to a lot of them. I can, I can see their challenge. And it's not something you see when you're a customer, but when, when you start to yeah. feel like you work in an industry, you start looking at things slightly differently. And because there's so many products and they've got to try and uh, to, uh, cater for so many different tastes, that's a real challenge in terms of moving things in and out and, and trying to get things perfect for everybody all the time. I, I can see that as being a, you know, an extreme challenge. So um, I, I give them yeah, a lot more slack yeah. nowadays than I did when I was a customer, if that makes sense. Why, why, yeah, why are things not perfect for me? Well, you've only come in for an hour. What about the rest of the year, if that makes sense? So I, I understand that. I get that. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, I want to move on and talk to you a bit more about the Mojo 2, uh, because I felt okay. that we, we could probably discuss some of the technologies in it, and that would relate to some of the other speakers that you design. Uh, and there's been a couple of questions that I, I was kind of going to ask anyway about the two the two mid-base driver design. But the, the big one for me is, is Aeroflex, because when I saw that on the website... I was like, um, I wonder if that's like a transmission line type design. But and I and I said that in the review. But I thought, well, I, I don't actually know. And I thought, well, I, I don't want to be led. I don't like being led in reviews. I don't. I'll ask a manufacturer the specific question if I want the answer. But I, I try and be as transparent if, if that makes sense, and, and don't let them get involved too much because, yeah. I, and I don't read other reviews because I don't. I don't want them influencing me either. I just want to be black and white with my opinion on, on things. So, what is Aeroflex? Mm -hmm. How does that work? And yeah, what, why is it special? You know, why why do you use it? Um, essentially, the idea for it came about just through lots and lots of trial and error and simulation and just kind of um, looking at the major uh, design topologies that are out there, you know, and kind of thinking, well, you know, ported, transmission, maybe there's some middle ground that's kind of both. Um, and. You know the, the idea that you you're either designing one thing or another thing um i think um isn't really how it works in the real world especially because even if you think about a say a ported speaker um imagine a very simple ported speaker where you put the port in the speaker is going to affect the sounds whether it's behind the base driver or is it the top of the cabinet that's going to affect the sounds um the, and, well, how, how does that affect the sound? It, is, that, is that to do just pressure, the way the pressure moves around the box? Is, is that why that affects the sound? It's in a different location in the box. It's going, to, it's going to react with the box and with the driver in a different way. So every single facet of the inside of the box is going to affect everything to a degree. But, um, and it's kind of a juggling act and just finding some middle ground, I guess. Uh, as far as Aeroflex, it's basically... As I've said uh, when I'm explaining it before and on the website, I think as well, um, it's a hybrid. Ultimately, some, it's an in betweeny between reflex ported systems and transmission lines. So it's uh, there is sort of a transmission line in there, but it's not a full length um, transmission line in yeah. the in the in the common sense. Um, and there's also a reflex ported chamber in there, so um, it's somewhere in between the two, and uh, the idea is basically to try and achieve uh, something that's in the middle that doesn't have the compromises of one or the other, but just something in between. Well, I was just thinking that it's one of those situations where you're trying to pull the best bits of, of two different two mm. different principles or, or practices and trying to, trying to make that work, yeah. especially in the small speaker. Like, I mean, obviously, the Mojos are really small. That's a very compact mm. speaker. So yep. how do you even get a port in that? You know, it's, that's, uh, <laughs> that must be, and two drivers and two bass drivers and a tweeter. So uh, how, how is that even physically possible? It's not, there is no space. <laughs> well, the, part of it is the fact that um, with, with the transmission line especially, um, if you're designing a tr transmission line, um, typically the um, you'll, you'll have some panels inside that are part of the cabinet that will make up the transmission line. And that kind of follows through to what I've done with the, uh, the M series, Mojo, Minimo and Mambo. Um, and um, essentially w with a ported system, you, more, more than likely these days, it will be a plastic port. It's not connected to anything particularly, it's just mounted into one of the panels. Um, so it doesn't offer any extra su support to the walls of the cabinet. So uh, with a transmission line, you can use 
thinner walls because you, you everything's braced by these extra panels that are inside and it's a similar situation with the mojo too so uh, we've got quite a thick front panel uh, to support the woofers and keep them rock solid uh, but the outer walls can be quite thin because they don't need to be thick they've got there's extra panels in there bracing everything um the best thing i can liken it to <laughs> Uh, which my, my my girlfriend will kick me for bringing up because I always talk about cars, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's a, a car chassis design. It's it's similar to the fact that um, you know heavier isn't always better, uh, it's stronger, and whether that's uh, different materials or just a different way of doing things in terms of the actual chassis design, and that's that's kind of the way I think about speaker cabinets as well. That is really that is really interesting. Again, I, I've done a couple of group tests now, and it's the same in this one compared to the last one. Some of the speakers you pick up really heavy; they feel like they're very thick MDF, and you know they feel like dead weights. And others, you feel like, oh, these feel really quite loose or, or light by comparison. Loose is the wrong word, but light by comparison, you can feel. Well, yeah. this is a much thinner, a thinner made chassis. But I never really thought of it in a sense that it's because it's braced in a different way. It might not necessarily need to be that. That's quite an interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Never thought of that to be honest, Gareth. Yeah. Um, someone's yeah. asked, obviously, a question, and it's the question I had mm -hmm. here anyway. Was you know why why the twin mid bass driver? And I suppose I don't know if it's because it wouldn't fit, but is the tweeter off offset for a, a, another reason? Um, well, um, the the reason for the twin uh, twin mid bass driver is because um, I mean, obviously, if you look at the minimo, there's one mid bass driver and the tweeter, um, and in the case of the mojo it made sense to keep the cabinet um, to a reasonable dimension width-wise especially uh, to use two of the same drivers. Um, it's not exactly the same driver, it's a different impedance, um, but uh, to keep the width to a reasonable uh, size to use two in a sort of offset MTM array. Um, as far as offsetting the tweeter to one side, um, it's a way of bringing the two mid-base drivers a little bit closer because if you can imagine uh, if they were directly vertical, um, the basically the, the gap between the two mid base drivers would be, um, I think it's something like 20, 25% greater, which in terms of the crossover point is actually quite significant oh, well. in terms of the way the two, uh, the output, because they're both producing mid and base and how that sounds um, kind of propagates. So um, yeah, um, as far as the offset as well, as you found in your review, uh, whether you have the tweeters out or in, that can generate different results. Uh, mm. Everyone seems to have a different idea of which they prefer. Um, that's fine by me, because at least you've got the option. So, so on, uh, actually, uh, made me look stupid, actually. They said, Terry, all you need to do is move the speaker in and out a little bit more, and it'll be the same thing. And I was scratching my head thinking, <laughs> yeah, that's probably true, actually. But I, I couldn't do it, obviously, because the stands were exactly the same place for every speaker. And I don't yes. really have the space anyway because of the whacking great big subwoofers that have been sitting there for months. And I, I don't even turn those on. It's just a shame because they're fantastic. But I can't turn yeah. them on because I'm not, I'm not just not doing home cinema work. And um, so yeah. that, that just is an option, if that makes sense. So it was... You know, make it work there or turn them around. So, uh, do, yep. do you have an advice? I was looking for the advice. Are you supposed to use them one way or the other? Let's actually pop up a picture. But um. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, I described it in the manual as saying that um, you, you get a different dispersion uh, de depending on whether the tweeters are on the outside or the inside. And like everything, I think it's experimentation. I mean, the same way that um, with any speaker, you would experiment a little bit with location in the room. Would you have them close to the wall, further out from the wall? Everything else, it's, I mean, a lot of it will be dictated, as most people find with their circumstances. Like you've said, you've got giant subwoofers uh, at one side, so you're kind of limited a little bit with where you could put the speakers, and that's fine. But that's that's completely normal. Like every, Everyone has limitations where they can put the speakers in the room. Um, but this is just one way of kind of tuning uh, without having to move the speakers physically. You can have the tweeters the outside or the inside, and whichever way you prefer, go with that. While we're talking about subwoofers, just out of curiosity, did you design the smaller speakers with someone's probably probably going to use these with a subwoofer to make them more full range? Was that any, uh, part of the design? Um, yes and no. I mean, um, I tried to hit some kind of middle ground, especially with the Minimo. Uh, I, I guess it goes back to the first Minimo, the Minimo version 1.0, so to speak. Um, the I, I felt that... Um, I wanted to design a speaker that was small, well, really small, um, but you could get away without a subwoofer if you, you know, if you had a reasonably small listening space, 
you could listen to speakers and they would be you know full range so to speak not not necessarily subwoofer range but fullish range full, full enough, without the full subwoofer. Enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. without feeling like you're missing out too much because i felt that there was um too many small speakers that i'd heard on the market uh, to make up for the fact they were small had kind of a hyped up 80 to 100 hertz kind of thumping bass range and absolutely nothing below that and they they kind of they sounded small um and i i thought well if you're listening close especially if you're listening close range you're not necessarily putting huge bags of power in um uh, along with the fact that the air reflex allows gets the absolute maximum out of the driver you can get um then yeah i just thought you know let's try and do something that's a bit more full range and it worked out quite nicely i yeah. think well, look, a lovely segue there. You mentioned drivers. Let's talk about the SEAS mm. tweeter because to me that was a, that was the, okay. you know, I hate to say something special about a speaker, but something stands out. Something always jumps out to you, and I'm mm. sure something else might jump out to somebody else. But in my room, yeah. which is very very acoustically treated, a lot a lot of tweeters where they're designed to be a bit more rolled off, a bit more pleasant sounding. I think for more normal rooms, the, the tweeters very rarely stand out in my room, and I and I take that on board. If that makes sense, I know my room is like this, and therefore, and I look at the measurements. I think, well, that this, this tweeter, this this speaker is designed more for a normal listening room rather than, you know, like a studio or whatever type sound. But the, your tweeter really stood out. The way, 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 the yeah, the clarity, the way that all worked. Yeah, tell me about, tell me about it. You know, kind of, you mentioned it's two hundred watts. So I was like, wow. But you know, <laughs> what, what, why do you choose that one? And are there other ones you can choose? And what the Sonolex coating and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, first of all, on the power handling side, uh, the um, yeah, I think the uh, larger version that they do um, that Sears make of of that driver that I use in the P series um, has a slightly higher power rating, but only marginally. So it's it's quite impressive what the little one will do, especially when you you think it's only fifty three millimeters wide. <laughs> You know, it looks like quite a small tweeter, but it, actually it's a 27 millimeter dome. So it's not, you know, it's a fairly standard size actual uh, tweeter dome. Um, as far as a Sonalex coating, um, that's a damping and sealing material that they apply to the fabric uh, of the dome. It basically seals and damps the, the driver and um, yeah, just, um, I would say just improves the clarity it's a, they say it's something like a four stage process i think um, yeah. i assume that's to do with making it probably stiffer and and less less behaving wrong in higher frequencies or you know the usual yes uh, to, behavior. To, it's to do with the um the material that they use and just kind of uh damping it so it doesn't re you know reduce any kind of yeah, uh, peaks and resonances yeah. Because yeah, actually, funny enough, it's not something I look at actually measurement wise, mm. but probably the ringing of the tweeter is probably the bit that causes the harshness. So you can have more treble mm. when it doesn't ring, if that makes sense. But when it's ringing and lingering, yep. that's probably the bit that your ear picks up as, well, that sounds metallic or that sounds nasty. I, I don't know that for definite, but I probably, it probably yeah. is, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, there's, I mean, every driver, I mean, tweeters or woofers, they, you know, they all have their kind of. Um, upsides and downsides and um i i think that that tweeter the reason why i've used that tweeter twice now because it is the same unit from the first generation m series um is because it's a very easy woof, uh, sorry tweeter to use and um you know to work with it's got very good power handling um it doesn't require a lot of fettling in terms of the crossover design because it's got quite a smooth response out of the box um they're incredibly reliable um and uh, I think I've had one tweet of failure after out of hundreds, you know, just, um, uh, yeah, it's, they're ex incredibly consistent as well um, as most sales products are, so. Well, I was, I was just thinking that uh, that's that's a, a sign of a, a top manufacturer, isn't it, really, manufacturing a quality product, and they are, it's, I, don't, I don't know of many speaker manufacturers because they're behind the scenes, so the actual speaker mm. manufacturers, but drivers, sorry, the driver manufacturers, they're, they're like hidden hidden companies, aren't they, really, you don't know they exist until, you know, people talk about them, and obviously SAS is one of the ones that I'm, I'm aware of, so um, yep. that's normally for a reason, that's what I'm, I suppose I'm getting at, but you, make, you mentioned the crossover, right, and obviously that's mm -hmm. probably... One of the most important things within a passive speaker. So, what, what is important in crossover design? And, and I suppose the, the one thing that jumped out to me was the use of Mundorf components. So, how, mm. how does that work? How, how can you afford to put Mundorf components in? Let's, let's ask that question. <laughs> um, yeah, well, 
that's the thing. I, I think Mondorf, um, I, I'd used all kinds of crossover components when I was kind of going through the early days of Ophidian and kind of um, looking at what was out there, where, where did I want to get the crossover components from? Because I'm always looking for, if I'm going to use a third party product in my product, um, I want something that's going to be consistent, high quality, um, you know, just something I can rely on. Some, it's always, and, and, you know, um, but as far as Mundorf, I, I just think um, they do such a great range of products all the way from kind of uh, fairly entry level in terms of their price point right up to the absolute extreme. Um, you know, some of the silver gold oil capacitors that cost several hundred euros each, you know. Um, but, you know, they, they do the full range right up to the, and, and as you say, that they're, they're used in quite very high-end esoteric speakers. Um, but I I felt that some, some of the uh, more moderately priced Mondorf components could mm. be used in a speaker at this price point. Um, and um, yeah, it's just Make it quality and consistency. That's yeah. what I was looking for. So, well, to, to me, it's back to what you said there. If, if you're going to use a third party to supply a product, you want to make sure it's a, a, a quality one. Which that that's, mm. it, it, it just stood out to me. It's not something that I've well, I, out of ten speakers that was the only one. So that's that's a sign of of how rare that is yeah. to use those. Yeah, I mean, um, specifically in the M series, I use all metal oxide resistors. Which I think is probably pretty rare at this price point. Okay. Um, but um, the the benefits over the more common cement style uh, resistors, lower inductance, and just more consistent um, accuracy. Um, but I I just think really uh, for the tiny cost saving between the metal oxides, you know, a, the a, you know a, a decent metal oxide from uh, Mondorf versus their own uh, still very high quality cement resistors it just wasn't worth the price saving yeah. it's just you know go with a more quality part well funnily enough that's where you might get a difference between a more boutique style manufacturer and a major large scale manufacturer because they might see that see that accounting decision quite differently there which is sometimes yeah. where you can get gems products i think from sometimes from the boutique boutique style manufacturers which that, that's not a pitch or a plug it's it's just it's the truth isn't it you're looking at it from a different economy yep. of scale it's, it's it's a different thing and actually speaking about that yep. the last kind of question i was going to ask you is obviously looking at the website um and if people are interested in affidian speakers there are several dealers in the uk if you're in the uk to go and have a listen which is which is really nice and then looking on there it seems like there is uh, dealers or distribution within australia which is interesting austria spain and sweden Mm -hmm. But obviously, a lot of the viewers on this channel are, are from the US. So, are there any other plans to maybe conquer new territories? And how does that even work? How do you go about finding distribution in different countries? And yes, yeah, it's, it's tricky. I mean, as far as um, especially US, US and Canada, you know, two huge markets over there. And um, for the time being, I'm still dealing with them directly. Mm -hmm. um, I have talked to a few different distributors over there, um, and. It's it's one of these situations where I'm I'm kind of looking for the right one to kind of um, take the brand on and really that's on the same wavelength I guess because I think early on when I was um, just starting out um, I think when I got interest from uh, you know various distributors in Europe uh, particularly I thought. Um, uh, you could, you know, I was just happy for them to distribute my product. That that was all fine, um, but you you kind of learn as you, as as you go that um, the, there's a certain way of doing business and kind of you want things to be kind of in simpatico with your brand and how you want to do business. Uh, so the same way that I do business with the retailers in the UK, I kind of want that kind of mirrored with the people I do uh, business with internationally. So. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm talking to somebody in the US at the moment that um, uh, might end up being a, a representative for the brand, uh, but I, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, I, I just kind of want to, it, when it's done, it's done kind of thing as far yeah, as the deal, so um, I don't want to kind of jump the gun. No, fair play. So, so if someone is from the US or a country that maybe is not on the website, right. if they were still interested to buy some speakers, there would be the opportunity, so they could contact you directly. I think that's really yeah, important, actually. Yeah. I'm, gl I'm glad I asked you that question because I, w I wouldn't have known that, and I assume if I don't know it, maybe someone else wouldn't know that. So, 
Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, I, I think I, I put a little bit on the website just saying um, that it, you know, if if you're someone and if there's no distributor near you, um, then feel free to get in contact directly. But yeah, um, I've dealt with quite a lot of people from countries all over the world who um, maybe haven't got distribution there yet, or um, or even just in the UK. In fact, there's a couple of spots where somebody is two hours or three hours from the nearest dealer so yeah. um, and i'm perfectly happy to deal with them directly because yeah yeah why not yeah it makes makes perfect you it probably does have that on there gareth I, I don't read the i just look at the pictures if there's pictures i look at them i don't do the reading part <laughs> <laughs> so you have to shoot, shoot me for that one um so let's quickly look i'm just going to flick through some of the questions there's, there's a good one in here funnily enough mm. that's come from lirad so lo lots of companies use air motion fold units obviously tweeters air motion tweeters and that type of design what, what do you think of that type of tweeter design and uh What's your idea on the speaker unit choices? So, so yeah, either way, so a, a folded, a folded tweeter or an air motion tweeter. Mm. What do you think yeah. to that design? And would you ever use one? I suppose is a is a question. Um, yeah, tricky one. I've, I think um, I'd never like to rule out um, using one former driver over another, just because maybe at some time down the line, I will end up using that form of driver. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I, as far as AMTs for me, I, I have tried a few. Um, they, there's pros and cons. I think that they're very much in vogue at the moment uh, with certain manufacturers really pushing them uh, as kind of like the more high-end tweeter. Um, I don't really see it like that. I think they're just a different way. Again, there's pros and cons to both forms. Um, AMTs typically, most of their advantage is above kind of like 10 kilohertz upwards. Um, and even then, um, the advantage really depends on what tweeter you're comparing it against and, and in what context. And, you know, it's complicated. But um, I would say the biggest difference is down low. Um, crossover point to the mid, whether it's a mid range in a three way or a mid base in a two way. Um, I think that's the area that AMTs struggle a bit compared to dome tweeters, uh, especially at higher power outputs. Um, things can get a bit. Okay. But uh, it, again, there's a lot of really high quality AMT yeah. um, units on the market now. I just haven't found the one that I want to use. Um, so I wouldn't rule out in the future, but for now, um, yeah, probably um, I'm sticking to dome tweeters personally for for the time being, at least. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if there would be a difference in dispersion because um, some of the the, um, oh. the the dome tweeter speakers that I've that I've measured in my room have be all behaved in similar but different ways. And then you look at mm. a folded. I'm trying to think what it would be an AMT or or that or a. A ribbon tweeter that's and it always you get a kind of a different yeah. kind of measurement sometimes they roll off and you think like well maybe maybe if i had them at a different height you know so i wondered if maybe they would be great for horizontal off axis but not so good for vertical but again that's probably per the tweeter isn't it again it's per in the individual unit rather than a a, a design-wide yes. thing yeah. across all of them yes um uh, yeah absolutely i mean in the smaller amts you'll see um the more kind of squared off kind of uh, size uh, they'll be generally similar in the kind of horizontal vertical but obviously that the more power handling they need the taller the um, stack becomes and the taller the uh, ribbon or amt becomes uh, and you what you tend to happen uh, see happening there is a uh, the horizontal remains quite wide whereas the vertical gets thinner and thinner mm. so that may or may not be a benefit or a drawback in your room again every listening room is different um so uh, I think if you look at um, Pro Audio, a lot of the Pro Audio um, uh, AMT kind of style designs, they're quite tall, so they're quite limited in their, uh, in their use. But um, I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's just a very different, uh, con such a different concept to a dome or a cone, or, you know, it's, it's a, yeah. th there's always gonna be pros and cons and kind of, uh, differences so um because yeah, to me I, I didn't know they, they even had them in the pro i thought everything pro was uh compression driver tweeters that's my very limited knowledge but i thought that was all they use that everybody uses a, a compression yeah. driver i didn't realize it was anything it's, else 
they, they, they do use them in pro as well, but just not as much. It's more near field stuff that you'll see kind of pro uh, level AMTs, but um, they're, yeah, I mean, compression drivers, uh, which are essentially cones with a very high uh, horn uh, compression, um, is the more common thing in pro audio. So they're, they're still very rare in, in that context. I. I can't really see them kind of that changing in the long term because it's it's just a different concept. But for near field applications, for studio monitoring stuff like that, they can be um, you know they're they're definitely an alternative uh, to domes. But um, as I said before, I think there's pros and cons to both. So let, let's twist the question a little bit, Gareth, because you, we spoke before mm. before coming alive. You said that you, you originally was working in kind of pro pro speakers, and that was of interest to yourself. So a lot of pro speakers are horn based tweet speakers, aren't they? Mids and, and tweeters. We spoke about a few manufacturers yes. that use that type of design. So obviously, you don't use that at the moment in your speakers. So why why would you mm. choose to go over horn or not go over horn? You know, what what, what are your thoughts on them? Um. <sighs> In pro audio, especially, I mean, uh, horns are much more directional. So, uh, especially if you're in a concert venue, you're trying to direct the sound to different areas. You're trying to control the sound as well for noise control because you want the sound to go where the audience is. You don't want it going out the building uh, this way. But I mean, there's only so much you can do, especially with the lower frequencies. But um, there's a, a well, there's a lot more you can do these days. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think as far as horns in hi-fi. Um, I personally really like horns, but they uh, they have to be done well, and they also kind of limit the price point a little bit. You can do maybe a horn tweeter um, without kind of going right up the top end of the price scale, but um, I think uh, integration with um, mid bass drivers, especially when you're talking about a horn tweeter, that's um, you know, most horn tweeters, the you're then talking about quite a big dif differentiation between where the tweeter is and where the woofer is. Time alignment becomes a concern in the passive speakers. Um, so yeah, I, I, the, I'd the, love the, to do. Oh, okay. I, I'd love to do a big horn speaker at some point, but I think that, it's that was going to be, be the question. Does it have to start getting yeah. bigger to, to make that work? That was going to be the question. Um, uh, as I say, you can definitely integrate. You can do. Um, you know, horn tweeters, especially fairly easy to integrate in, well, with caveats into kind of more modestly sized speakers. But uh, when you start talking about mids, especially bass horns, they're always going to be big. You, you can't get around physics that much. You can bend physics a little bit, but uh, yeah, there's, there's always going to be a size factor yeah. involved there. So. Well, a lot. Obviously, there are obviously manufacturers like Klipsch, which make obviously more more affordable versions of horn speakers. But yep. normally, when you go to a hi-fi show, something like the Munich High End Show, and you start looking at the the proper horn speakers with these whacking great big, mm. you know, big horns. Yeah. Obviously, there's there's only so many audio files that can have have space for those types of systems. Especially the uh, you get yeah. the old Western yeah. Electric ones from the cinemas. They're they're unbelievable in terms of huge mm. great big things. So obviously, it's only a limited. But it, it, even that as a, as a thing, it's like. I mean, I, I think they're great. I love them, but only, uh, that's not mm. going to appeal to many people. It's like a really niche within a niche who who would who wants those you know, hu huge, great Definitely. things. You know, it's but they and they and I think they sound fantastic for certain types of music, like raspy trumpets and stuff. Sound really raspy and really trumpety coming through those types of speakers. Mm. But I wondered how they would sound for because obviously when you go to a show, you, you're getting played music that's not yours. I wondered how they would sound for I don't know R and B or just you know hard hitting. Hard hitting dance oh, yeah. and stuff like that. It'd probably be amazing, but it's until you hear it, you can't tell, can you? I think w when I was first getting interested in pro audio, some of the speakers that I thought sounded the best were horn speakers. Uh, but the, I think there's a quite a big, um, especially bass horn speakers, but I think there's a quite a big differentiator between what we're seeing in hi fi at the moment. Uh, horn speakers and, and that uh, I think quite a lot of the hi-fi speaker pro uh, um, a lot of the hi-fi horns that I've seen quite typically using smaller drivers in quite a large horn to kind of okay. maximize the sounds um, from you know quite a small driver that wouldn't really be suitable at, uh, certainly at that price that whatever price point they're aiming at in a more conventional system um, I, I'm, I'm not always sure of the logic behind some of the designs I've seen. And I must admit, as far as horn speakers, 
Um, I like the concept better than the execution in most cases. I think um, out of all the when I went to Munich in I think it was 2018 now, um, the horn speakers that I liked the most there was probably one horn speaker to every you know three uh, more conventional speakers that I that I liked. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that horns can't sound really good; they definitely can. But I think they're also a design that takes that they can be um there's many more ways to do them wrong so to speak mm. <laughs> you know yeah i've always thought they, they've sounded certain ways if that makes sense which sometimes mm. that's just going to appeal to you or, or it's not isn't it that's just how this how this yeah. industry is especially, I speak especially at a show when you're just pottering around and you're just sitting and listening and especially at something like the music high-end show because you're expecting audio glory every single demo and it and that just doesn't happen because it could just be where you sit. Mm. It could just be the music's come on. It's just not. It's not clicking for you or not clicking for, uh, for the system. Mm. And obviously, because I've done a lot of show videos, one of the biggest complaints about the show videos one is people talking, which I understand. But the other one is why are you playing this music? Why are you not playing something that's more challenging or more demonstrating mm. of the system? It was like, well, like, over four or five days of a Munich show, they're going to play all sorts of music, aren't they? It's just this is what's on oh, yeah, when I'm in yeah. there. It's 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 one of those. But it, that is the same. As someone attended the show, they walked into the rooms. They would only ever hear one song or two songs, and, and that, that's their yeah. whole demo. So it's that, that that's one of the big challenges. Like, obviously, you've done Bristol, haven't you? You've done shows, so that's one of the I assume the biggest challenges of a hi fi show is how do you please everybody? You can't, can you? You can't, no, absolutely. And especially something like Bristol, where you, you might have you know, if somebody's coming in and they've at least heard of the brands and they're uh, kind of. They, you know, it, it was on their checklist of things to listen to because they might be looking at, uh, let, uh, you know, buying your speakers. Then they'll typically spend more time, and they might ask, "Have you got some?" I'm not familiar with this music. Could I have a listen to this or that? And I always try and cater, you know, as, as best as you can. Um, but you quite often get people coming in and they spend 30 seconds stood in the doorway, not really yeah. listening properly, which is very frustrating. Um, that's particularly bad at but, Bristol because the the, the, the way yeah. the rooms are, you've got the tunnel effect, haven't you? Because you've oh, got yeah. the bathroom. So if anybody's watching this who's going to go to the Bristol show, which, show, which hopefully will be on next year, 2022, if it's yep. at the uh, the uh, Hilton, is it Hilton or the Marriott? I'm getting confused. Hilton, is uh, it? The Marriott. 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 Okay. Yep. So you've got, do not judge a system by that doorway because you're going to get the very worst sound possible in that doorway. Sometimes you can't get in the room, which is not your fault, but if you're going to listen, bloody go in and listen is my advice because you'll, ne you'll never get anything from the doorway. Never, ever anything from that doorway. In fact, you're, you're going to get the very worst possible because you're going to get the echo, aren't you, between the, between the walls exactly. that, are about that far apart. So uh, that's my advice. You actually hear a common... You hear a common ringing frequency in every <laughs> yeah. doorway because it's the same width. So yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's, yeah. So speaking about that, obviously, I mean, I haven't spoke to anybody about Bristol next year. I'm hoping it'll be on because mm. hopefully COVID will be, you know, in, in some form or another. So has, has there been any talk about that? And will you do it next year if the show is on? Um, yeah, I mean, as I'd definitely be open to doing it. Um, I'm... I mean, it's run by Audio T, um, who I'm quite friendly with. I'm in a couple of their stores, so uh, I'll certainly be talking to them and uh, seeing seeing what happens. Um, obviously, they've got to be careful because, uh, as we found with so many things during this this period, things can change very quickly, and they don't want to get caught out because um, it's a very expensive show to put on. So, um, can totally understand that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm definitely keen to get back there at some point and, uh, yeah, look forward to being back there soon. Excellent. We've had a couple of questions come in. I don't want to miss them because, uh, <laughs> horns should be banned. <laughs> it's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where are we? Start? That's a good question. I've missed it. All right. Someone's asked actually jingle nuts, which makes me laugh. Do, do bypass caps make a difference in the sound? And do you use bypass caps on the woofer mids and tweeters? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I've always thought um, there was a lot of um, hearsay and not a lot of science behind the idea of bike by pack caps. So uh, I think um, personally, I just invest in good quality caps, um, as I have done with the Mundorf. Um, so I don't use them on on the tweeters. Um, 
I think the idea of using one small, very high quality cap with one larger, you know, less quality, I, I, it doesn't make much sense to me. It's a bit like using, uh, you know, uh, one small ratty cable with a very, sorry, one very high quality cable with a, so I, I mean, same reason really why I, uh, decided to stick with single wire on my speakers. I mean, everyone's got their own interpretation with by wire, by amp, whether or not there's any benefit there. Personally, I've always thought when it comes down to it, you know, if you spend X amount of money on one good quality wire, then you're going to have to spend double to see any benefit, you know, with uh, by amp. So I, I just, or, or by wire. So I, I just think uh, it's a similar kind of situation there with bypass cups. So you'd rather That's just go, my personal. No, of course, yeah. You'd rather go with one really good one yeah. to do the job mm -hmm. rather than trying to off offset the cost of two lesser quality ones. Basically, yeah. is what you're trying to say, which makes makes perfect yeah. sense in that regard. Uh, another question came in, which is actually quite an interesting one in, in, in a way as well. So, this is from Jason Greensmith. Do the Mojo Two sound better with certain types of music? So I suppose it's, when you design mm. a speaker, what music are you designing it for? That's another. How, how, <laughs> how do you, how do you how do you do that? Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible, isn't it? Because, I mean, even if you just take one genre, then there's so many different albums that are recorded different ways and not one genre, you know. I mean, you might end up, uh, if you use, you know, kind of a specific playlist of, of stuff, ending up with one kind of a general mix of stuff. Uh, I mean, I kind of try to uh, meet a middle ground between measurements and listening. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I listen to all kinds of music, so I, I, I there's, there's less music types that I don't listen to than there are that I do. So I, I like to think anyway. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this I, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to say that my sound, you know, my speakers sound better or worse with hip hop than they do with classical. I mean, it's personal kind of interpretation ultimately so uh, take a listen and see what you think for yourself yeah, that's what yeah, i would that, say that's the best advice have a listen don't don't mm. prejudge mm. always have a listen never mm. prejudge is my I, i've been caught out too many yeah. times for making a pre that's going to be like that oh wow it's nothing like that so uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. Caught, uh, yeah it's caught me out a lot even in the, the last couple of months it's like oh god that's nothing like what i expected yeah. so uh, that's yeah i can't give better advice than that never prejudge always listen um that, that's a different kind of question what i was going to ask is and i ask every manufacturer this and it, it sometimes puts people on the spot, and I apologise if it is, and say no if you, if you want to, but is there anything that we can look forward to, anything new and exciting that we can look forward to in the near future? Uh, there certainly is. Um, <laughs> if I turn my camera this way, no, I'm not going to. No, don't do it, don't do it, don't, don't do it. Don't. Yeah, I'll have to but, shut the video down, yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to delete it. Cause, uh, <laughs> no, there's, there's definitely some new stuff on the horizon, uh, hopefully in the... Uh, Quite near term actually so some new new news on the horizon soon and uh, i'm sure i'll let you know terry oh, as, please soon do. As, uh, as, as soon as, mm. uh, as there's something i can actually talk about a bit yeah please so. do because again it's, it's back to that it's, it's nice to see manufacturers developing new products as you said you've been business 10 years which is a very long time but it's also mm. um you know a, 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 uh, we look at companies like Luxman, 95 years or 100 years there's, there's obviously a big difference so it, and, yeah. and obviously it, ta it takes you know it's a lot of work to run a business. It's a lot of work to develop products, and it's nice to see, you know, companies start somewhere, grow and develop, bring more, bring more people in, more people discover them. Um, it's not, it's nice to see, um, and I always get excited, excited about new things. I'm, I'm a uh, from the generation of it's got to be new. New is always better. So, it's, <laughs> give me something new to get excited about. It's always the way. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. Someone's put about a Psytrance. They've never heard Psytrance at shows. Well, funnily enough, my Guilty Pleasure music is uh, Asterix Psytrance, which I actually heard at the Bristol show uh, yeah. a couple of years ago. And they was playing it in the Spendor room on the old classic, I think it was Classic 100 or something speakers, which are the old, traditional, yeah. old-fashioned looking speakers with Aurelic. Was it uh, the was it the, stand, the large stand mount they do or, uh, the, or the big floor stander? Uh, yes, yeah, like a larger stand mount. Um, I, I can't remember exactly, oh, okay. but there's a video on it on the channel if you want to look it up, and they was playing oh. it in there. And it was funny because it was mostly older gentlemen in there that was in there. 
and they was playing this side trance music, which never ever happens. And I was looking around, because I was filming, and obviously I'm looking around the whole time trying to see people's reactions. And you would expect people to be up in arms with the music, but nobody was even speaking. They was all silent because it's quite engulfing, engrossing music. It, it's it's it takes it's trance, isn't it? It pulls you on a journey. So I was expecting yeah. these older gentlemen to be moaning, and they wasn't. They was absolutely loving it because it was sounding fantastic. And it's I say it's very deep music, and um, yeah, I was really quite surprised every by time, that. So. I, every time I've done the Bristol show, I've, I've very much learned that you can't judge what people are into music wise, you know, uh, people come in and um, somebody say, Oh, can I have this jazz? Whatever. You're like, okay. Yeah. Fine. Some, some old fella came in and said, Oh, have you got any drum and bass? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yes. got some drum and bass. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you, you never know. It's often the people you least expect, that, you know, but you can't judge a book, book by its cover, as they say. And it's the same with music taste. It's interesting because I, I know a lot of people seem to say like classical music is what you've got to listen to classical. Mm. Only classical music will test the system properly. And I never used to believe that, but because uh, I didn't really listen to a lot of classical music. When you actually listen to some, I can see why they say that because there are big dynamic swings. You've got obviously a, a lot of musical separation. You've got a lot of atmosphere. Mm. You've got big crescendos, and you've got you know sometimes quite a lot of quite hard and harsh sounding parts in classical music as well. Yeah. Which is probably why I like it because I've got gentle, delicate ears. I only like the stuff that gives me a cuddle. <laughs> I'm joking, but yeah. it's just, it's one of those things. It's like, oh well, I can see why. But I think when you listen to other music, it tests the system in a different way. Like for example, side mm. is You know, how kicking is the bass? How tight is that? And you know, how, how mm -hmm. nightclub does it sound? And that might not be what everybody's looking for, but they probably mm. should be looking for that sound with that type of music because that's what it's designed to yeah. do. So while classical is supposed to do this and give you this experience. Well, that music's supposed to give you this experience as well, isn't it? So uh, a good system should really do it all. But I, I don't think any system probably does it all perfectly. But um, I've always thought it, it should be able to do everything, not, not just, you know, or classical shouldn't be the only the only test factor. I don't know if that's the right word to use. but um, Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, ultimately it comes back to what we were saying about no speaker is going to be 100% for everyone. They're all, to a degree, a little bit of a compromise in, in one direction or the other. Um, so something that is really good with classical probably won't be quite as good with the side trans, but <laughs> you, you never know that you might find that speaker that's got the balance in between that can do both. And, you know, um, I, yeah, you, you that's what I always aim. Not, I'm not even a big football fan, but you can't help but be, uh, engrossed in the atmosphere a little bit, can't you? It is fun, isn't it? It's mm. exciting and it is fun. Um, but it's, it's only fun until you lose, and then it's oh god! <laughs> and I, I've been through that so many times as a young as a young boy. I've been through it so many times, and it's like we've got to win some way. We've got, got to win some year. We've got to have a bit of luck some sometime. Um, it would be nice, definitely would be nice <laughs> to see, but. Yeah. We never know, never know. Well, look, Gareth, thank you very much. I really appreciate coming on, you know, for your time, and it's been a really interesting uh, video. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm just going to close this out. Um, here we are. So. Again, thanks very much to Gareth for coming on this live stream video. I really appreciate it. Thank you to you for watching this video as well, whether it be live or whether it's after the event. There's lots of videos in the Pursuit of Perfect System YouTube channel, especially if you're interested in the Affiliate Mojo 2 speakers, you'll find a full review for them and a sound demonstration video for them as well, where I compared them to a Sonos Faber speaker, which when you think about that, that's coming from one of the big speaker manufacturers and you can hear the differences for yourself. And I think you'd be quite surprised and impressed. So thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll definitely see you soon. And yeah, take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Here you go, that's finished now, Gary.